A Clergyman's Daughter by George Orwell Chapter 1, Part 1 As the alarm clock on the chest of drawers exploded like a horrid little bomb of bell metal, Dorothy, wrenched from the depths of some complex, troubling dream, awoke with a start and lay on her back looking into the darkness in extreme exhaustion. The alarm clock continued its nagging, feminine clamour, which would go on for five minutes or thereabouts if you did not stop it. Dorothy was aching from head to foot, and an insidious and contemptible self-pity, which usually seized upon her when it was time to get up in the morning, caused her to bury her head in the bedclothes and try to shut the hateful noise out of her ears. She struggled against her fatigue, however, and, according to her custom, exerted herself sharply in the second person plural. Come on, Dorothy. Up you get. No snoozing, please. Proverbs 6, 9. Then she remembered that if the noise went on any longer, it would wake her father, and with a hurried movement she bound out of bed, seized the clock from the chest of drawers, and turned off the alarm. It was kept in the chest of drawers precisely in order that she could have to get out of bed to silence it. Still in darkness, she knelt down at her bedside and repeated the Lord's Prayer but rather distractedly, her feet being troubled by the cold. It was just past half five, and coldish for an August morning. Dorothy, her own name was Dorothy Hare, and she was the only child of Reverend Charles Hare, rector of St. Alliston's, Knipe Hill, Suffolk, put on her aged flanette dressing gown, and felt her way downstairs. There was a chill morning smell of dust, damp plaster, and the fried dabs of yesterday's supper, and from either side of the passage, on the second floor, she could hear the antiphorial snoring of her father and of Ellen, the maid of all work. With care, for the kitchen table had a nasty trick of reaching out in the darkness and banging you on the hip bone, Dorothy felt her way into the kitchen, lighted the candle on the mantelpiece, and still aching with fatigue, knelt down and raked the ashes out of the range. The kitchen fire was a beast to light. The chimney was crooked and therefore perpetually half-choked, and the fire, before it would light, expected to be doors with a cup full of kerosene, like a drunkard's morning nip of gin. Having set the kettle to boil for her father's shaving water, Dorothy went upstairs and turned on her bath. Ellen was still snoring, with heavy youthful snores. She was a good, hard-working servant once she was awake, but she was one of those girls whom the devil and all his angels cannot get out of bed before seven in the morning. Dorothy filled the bath as slowly as possible, as Bashing always woke her father if she turned the tap on too fast, and stood for a moment regarding the pale, unappetizing pool of water. Her body had gone goose-flesh all over. She detested cold baths. It was for that very reason that she made it a rule to take all of her baths cold from April to November, putting a tentative hand into the water. It was horribly cold. She drove herself forward with her usual excitations. Come on, Dorothy, in you go. No funking, please. Then she stepped resolutely into the bath, sat down, and let the icy girdle of water slide up her body and immerse her all except her hair, which she had twisted up behind her head. The next moment she came to the surface, gasping and wriggling, and I no sooner got her breath back when she remembered her memo list which she had brought down in her dressing gown pocket, and intended to read. She reached out for it, and, leaning over the side of the bath, waist deep in icy water, read through the memo list by the light of the candle on the chair. Then Dorothy got out her bath, and as she dried herself with a towel hardly bigger than a table napkin, they could not afford decent-sized towels at the rectory. Her hair came unpinned, and fell down over her collarbones in two heavy strands. It was thick, fine, exceedingly pale hair, and it was perhaps as well that her father had forbidden her to bob it, for it was her only positive beauty. For the rest, she was a girl of middle height, rather thin, but strong and shapely, and her face was a weak point. It was a thin, blonde, unremarkable kind of face, with pale eyes and a nose just a shade too long. If you looked closely, you could see the crow's feet around the eyes, and the mouth, when it was in repose, looked tired. Not definitely a spinsterish face as yet, but it certainly would be so in a few years' time. Nevertheless, strangers commonly took her to be several years younger than her real age. 
she was not quite twenty-eight, because of the expression of almost childish earnestness in her eyes. Her left forearm was spotted with tiny red marks like insect bites. Dorothy put on her nightdress again, and cleaned her teeth, plain water, of course. Better not use toothpaste before H.C. After all, either you are fasting or you aren't. The R.C.'s are quite right there. And even as she did so, suddenly faltered and stopped. She put her toothbrush down. A deadly pang, an actual physical pang, had gone through her viscera. She had remembered, with the ugly shock with which one remembers something disagreeable for the first time in the morning, the bill at Cargill's, the butcher's, which had been owing for seven months. That dreadful bill. It might be nineteen pounds or even twenty, and there was hardly the remotest hope of paying it. It was one of the chief torments of her life. At all hours of the night or day, it was waiting just around the corner of her consciousness, ready to spring upon her and agonise her, and with it came the memory of a score of lesser bills, mounting up to a figure of which she dare not even think. Almost involuntarily, she began to pray. Please, God, let not Cargill send in his bill again today. But the next moment she decided that this prayer was worldly and blasphemous, and she asked for forgiveness in it. Then she put on her dressing gown, and ran down to the kitchen in hopes of putting the bill out of her mind. The fire had gone out, as usual. Dorothy relayed it, dirtying her hands with cold dust, dozed it afresh with kerosene, and hung around anxiously until the kettle boiled. Father expected his shaving water to be ready at a quarter past six, just seven minutes late. Dorothy took the can upstairs and knocked at her father's door. Come in, come in, said a muffled, irritable voice. The room, heavily curtained, was stuffy with a masculine smell. The rector had lighted the candle on his bed table, and was lying on his side, looking at his gold watch, which he had just drawn from beneath his pillow. His hair was as white and thick as thistledown. One dark, bright eye glanced irritably over his shoulder at Dorothy. Good morning, father. I do wish, Dorothy, said the rector indistinctly. His voice always sounded muffled and senile until he had put his false teeth in. You would make some effort to get Ellen out of bed in the mornings, or else be a little more punctual yourself. I'm so sorry, father. The kitchen fire kept going out. Very well. Put it down on the dressing table. Put it down and draw those curtains. It was daylight now, but a dull, clouded morning. Dorothy hastened up to her room and dressed herself with a lightning speed which she found necessary six mornings out of seven. There was only a tiny square of mirror in the room, and even that one she did not use. She simply hung a gold cross around her neck, Plain gold cross, no crucifixes, please. Twisted her hair into a knot behind, stuck a number of hairpins rather sketchily into it, and threw her clothes, grey jersey, threadbare Irish tweed coat and skirt, stockings not quite matching the coat and skirt, and much-worn brown shoes, onto herself in the space of about three minutes. She had got to do out the dining room and her father's study before church. Besides saying her prayers in preparation for Holy Communion, which took her not less than twenty minutes. When she wheeled her bicycle out the front gate, morning was still overcast, and the grass sodden with heavy dew. Through the mist that wreathed the hillside, St. Athelstan's church loomed dimly, like a leaden sphinx, its single bell tolling funerally, boom, boom, boom. Only one of the bells was now in active use, the other seven had been unswung from their cage, and had lain silent these three years past, slowly splintering the floor of the belfry beneath their weight. In the distance, from the mists below, you could hear the offensive clatter of the bell in the R.C. church, a nasty, cheap, tinny little thing which the rector of St. Athelstan's used to compare to a muffin bell. Dorothy mounted her bicycle and rode swiftly up the hill, leaning over her handlebars, the bridge of her thin nose was pink in the morning cold. A red shank whistled overhead, invisible against the clouded sky. Early in the morning my song shall rise to thee. Dorothy propped her bicycle against the lich gate, and, 
finding her hands still grey with coal dust, knelt down and scrubbed them clean in the long wet grass between the graves. Then the bell stopped ringing, and she jumped up and hastened into church, just as Proggett, the sexton, in ragged Cossack and vast labourer's boots, was clomping up the aisle to take his place at the side altar. The church was very cold, with a scent of candle wax and ancient dust. It was a large church, much too large for its congregation, and ruinous, and more than half empty. The three narrow islands of pews stretched barely halfway down the nave, and beyond them the great wastes of bare stone floor in which a few worn inscriptions marked the sites of ancient graves. The roof of the chancel was sagging visibly. Beside the church expenses box, two fragments of riddled beam explained mutely that this was due to the mortal foe of Christendom, the Death Watch Beetle. The light filtered, pale coloured, through windows of anemic glass. Through the open south door you could see a ragged cypress, and the burrows of a lime tree, greyish in the sunless air, and swaying faintly. As usual, there was only one other communicant, Old Miss Mayfell of the Grange. The attendance at Holy Communion was so bad that the rector could not even get any boys to serve him, except on Sunday mornings, when the boys liked showing off in front of the congregation in their Cossacks and surplices. Dorothy went into the pew behind Miss Mayfield, and, in penitence for some sin of yesterday, pushed away the hassock and knelt on the bare stones. The service was beginning. The rector, in Cossack and short linen surplice, was reciting the prayers in a swift, practised voice, clear enough now that his teeth were in, and curiously ungenial. In his fastidious, aged face, pale as a silver coin, there was an expression of aloofness, almost of contempt. This is a valid sacrament, he seemed to be saying, and it is my duty to administer to you, but remember that I am only your priest, not your friend. As a human being, I dislike you and despise you. Proggett, the sexton, a man of forty, with curly grey hair and a red harassed face, stood patiently by, uncomprehending but reverent, fiddling with the little communion bell, which was lost in his huge red hands. Dorothy pressed her fingers against her eyes. She had not yet succeeded in concentrating her thoughts. Indeed, the memory of Chargill's bill was still worrying her intermittently. The prayers, which she knew by heart, were flowing through her head unheeded. She raised her eyes for a moment, and they began immediately to stray, first upwards, till the headless roof angels on whose necks you could still see the saw cuts of the Puritan soldiers, then back again, to Miss Mayfield's black, quasi-pork-pie hat and tremendous jet earrings. Miss Mayfield wore a long, musty black overcoat, with a little collar of greasy-looking astrakhan, which had been the same since Dorothy could remember. It was of some very peculiar stuff, like watered silk, but coarser, with rivulets of black piping wandering all over it, no discoverable pattern. It might even have been that legendary and proverbial substance, Black Bomazine. Miss Mayfield was very old, so old that no one remembered her as anything but an old woman. A faint scent radiated from her, an ethereal scent, analyzable as eau de cologne, mothballs, and a subflavor of gin. Dorothy drew a long glass-headed pin from the lapel of her coat, and fervently, under cover of Miss Mayfield's back, pressed the pin against her forearm. Her flesh tingled apprehensively. She made it a rule, whenever she caught herself not attending to her prayers, to prick her arm hard enough to make blood come. It was her chosen form of self-discipline, her guard against irreverence and sacrilegious thoughts. With the pin poised in readiness, she managed for several moments to pray more collectedly. Her father had turned one dark eye disapprovingly upon Miss Mayfield who was crossing herself at intervals, a practice he disliked. A starling chattered outside. With a shock, Dorothy discovered that she was looking vaingloriously at the pelts of her father's surplice, which she herself had sewn two years ago. She set her teeth 
and drove the pin an eighth of an inch into her arm. They were kneeling again. It was the general confession. Dorothy recalled her eyes, wandering, alas, yet again, this time to the stained glass window on her right, designed by Sir Ward Took, ARA, in 1851, and representing St. Athelstan's welcome at the gates of heaven by Gabriel, and a legion of angels all remarkably like one another, and the prince consort, and pressed the pinpoint against a different part of her arm. She began to meditate conscientiously on the meaning of each phrase of the prayer, and so brought her mind back to a more attentive state. But even so, she was all but obliged to use the pen again when Pargot tinkled the bell in the middle of Therefore with angels and archangels, being visited, as always, by a dreadful temptation to begin laughing at that passage. It was because of a story her father had told her once, of how when he was a little boy, and serving the priest at the altar, the communion bell had a screw-on clapper, which had come loose, and so the priest had said, Therefore with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee, and saying, Screw it up, you fat little head, screw it up! As the rector finished the consecration, Miss Mayfield began to struggle to her feet with extreme difficulty and slowness, like some disjointed wooden creature picking itself up by sections, and disengaging at each movement a powerful whiff of mothballs. There was an extraordinary creaking sound, from her stays, presumably, but it was a noise as of bones grating against one another. You could have imagined that there was only a dry skeleton inside the black overcoat. Dorothy remained on her feet a moment longer. Miss Mayfield was creeping towards the altar with slow, tottering steps. She could barely walk, but she took better offence if you offered to help her. In her ancient, bloodless face, her mouth was surprisingly large, loose, and wet, the underlip pendulous with age, slobbered forward, exposing a strip of gum, and a row of false teeth as yellow as the keys of an old piano. On the upper lip was a fringe of dark, dewy moustache. It was not an appetising mouth, not the kind of mouth you would like to see drinking out of your cup. Suddenly, spontaneously, as all the devil himself had put it there, the prayer slipped from Dorothy's lips. Oh God, let me not have to take the chalice after Miss Mayfell. The next moment, in self-horror, she grasped the meaning of what she had said, and wished that she had bitten her tongue in two, rather than utter that deadly blasphemy upon the very altar steps. She drew the pin again from her lapel, and drove it into her arm so hard that it was all she could do to suppress a cry of pain. Then she stepped to the altar and knelt down meekly on Miss Mayfield's left, so as to make quite sure of taking the chalice after her. Kneeling with head bent, and hands clasped against her knees, she set herself swiftly to pray for forgiveness, before her father should reach her with the wafer. But the current of her thoughts had been broken. Suddenly it was quite useless attempting to pray. Her lips moved, but there was neither heart nor meaning in her prayers. She could hear Proggett's boots shuffling, and her father's clear, low voice murmuring, Take and eat. She could see the worn strip of red carpet beneath her knees. She could smell dust, and eau de cologne, and mothballs, but of the body and blood of Christ, of the purpose for which she had come here, she was as though deprived of the power to think. A deadly blankness had descended upon her mind. It seemed to her that she actually could not pray. She struggled, collected her thoughts, uttered mechanically the opening phrases of a prayer, but they were useless, meaningless. Nothing but the dead shells of words. Her father was holding the wafer before her, in his shapely, aged hand. He held it between finger and thumb, fastidiously, somehow distastefully, as though it had been a spoon of medicine. His eye was upon Miss Mayfell, who was doubling herself up like a geometrid caterpillar, with many creakings, and crossing herself so elaborately that one might have imagined that she was sketching a series of braid frogs on the front of her coat. For several seconds Dorothy hesitated, and did not take the wafer. She dared not take it. Better, far better to step down from the altar, than to accept the sacrament with such chaos in her heart. Then it happened that she glanced sidelong through the open south door, 
A momentary spear of sunlight had pierced the clouds. It struck downwards through the leaves of the limes, and a spray of leaves in the doorway gleamed with a transient, matchless green, greener than jade or emerald or Atlantic waters. It was as though some jewel of unimaginable splendour had flashed for an instant, filling the doorway with a green light, and then faded. A flood of joy ran through Dorothy's heart. The flash of living colour had brought back to her, by a process deeper than reason, her peace of mind, her love of God, her power of worship. Somehow, because of the greenness of the leaves, it was again possible to pray. O all you green things upon the earth, praise ye the Lord. She began to pray ardently, joyfully, thankfully. The wafer melted upon her tongue. She took the chalice from her father and tasted without repulsion, even with an added joy in the small act of self-abasement, the wet imprint of Miss Mayfell's lips on its silver rim. Okay, so it started raining in the middle of that. And then for some reason, it, toward the end, it went a bit quiet. And I really don't know why. But yeah, if you really liked that, then please like and subscribe for more. I'm going to be recording the whole book of A Clergyman's Daughter. And maybe some other things too. I also do literary analysis and other readings on my channel.